testing. <laughs> Just checking. Hold on, guys. I'm going to see if I should be part of this. <laughs> Good morning. I have a number of announcements. Good to see everyone this morning. Before I go into our, our announcements, I want to just say hi. It's good to be here. Um, if you're new, <laughs> hello, I got a wave. If you're new here, I would love after the service to, uh, to talk to you if you have any questions. We do this every week. So I'm one of the pastors here. We have what we call a meet and greet. So after the service, if you have questions about our church, uh, you, you can meet me in the room labeled meet and greet. It's through these double doors. Take a, a right-hand turn down the main hallway, and you'll see me standing there after the service. I'd love to meet with you guys, with anyone. So here's uh, shotgun announcements. You ready? Ladies gathering Christmas event. It's a night of fellowship and worship. Um, it's going to be Monday, December 11th from 7 to 9 here at the church. And that's p.m., okay, 7 to 9 p.m. at the church, Monday, December 11th. We also have a free babysitting night. On Wednesday, December 13th, the student ministries will be offering to babysit the younger children in the church to allow parents a free evening. Um, that will begin at 6 o'clock and end at 8.30. It is a free event open to children of members and regular attenders from toddlers through fifth grade. Pizza and snacks will be provided. They are asking that you do register your children. Don't just show up and drop your kids off because they won't know how much pizza and all that stuff. So uh, make sure you register that way. Okay. Children's choir practice. We are having a practice in the worship center after church next Sunday. So children's choir next Sunday, December 17th. We are asking parents to please pick up their children from their classes and, and bring them to the worship center for practice immediately following the worship service. The word immediately is actually like right away. <laughs> that means right. Like after you go, you, you don't get sidetracked like I would, okay? Candlelight Christmas worship service. Our special candlelight service will be Sunday, December 24th at 10 o'clock. In addition to Pastor Mike preaching a Christmas message, there will be several times of special music. I love that. I can't wait for it. Mike and the special music. There are invitation cards in the foyer for you guys to invite other people, friends, family to this service. There will be no 9 o'clock learning hour that day. Christmas Eve service, we will also be having a service the evening of December 24th at 5 o'clock. The service will include scripture reading and singing. That's Christmas Eve, 5 o'clock. And last, children's ministry teachers needed for next block. We are in need of teachers for our next teaching block, January and February, in our children's ministry. If you can help, please see Pastor Mike or Caleb. So I, we just... I know it always seems like we're pounding down that door asking for help in that area, um, but it is an important thing, and we just we need that, that help. So if you have a desire at all, please see them, all right? Well, with that, let's, let me quickly pray, and then we'll transition into worship, okay? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we have much to be thankful for, we have much to be joyful for, and in this time of the year, um, there is a lot of fabricated happiness. I pray that we'd be a people who actually have joyful hearts, 
for the simple fact that you purchased for yourself a church. The greatest gift ever given. And as we worship and sing with one another today, I pray that our focus would be on you. We pray all these things in your precious and holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please stand.
wise man approached this manger throne with honors from afar. Behold the Son of God and bow down in this place. The Prince of Peace has come to us. Oh, Our scripture reading today is found in Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4. It's a wonderful reminder. And if you consider these verses, it's something that we talked about at our Christmas party last night with the college group. Christmas is not just a way in a manger. It's also death on the cross, resurrection, and glorification someday, right? From beginning to end. And I love these verses that Pastor Mike is having me read. Just think about what I just said as I read this. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on the things on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Let's pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, with those verses read, I pray that our spirits would be pricked and reminded that in fact our lives are hidden with Christ. For that's the only way, Father, that you can even look upon us and not see our sin. Christ bore that. And help us during this Christmas season and in all seasons to keep that, that beautiful truth on the forefront of our minds as we move through our lives, as we interact with church members and fellow believers, as we move through our families, our wives and our husbands and our children, as we move through the secular world, through work and interactions. May we, may we realize that our hope is in you and not on the things of this earth. Lord, we thank you so much for the provisions that you give us. They are bountiful. You are a good God who gives abundantly, and this church has been blessed, and we're so thankful. We love you, and we pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. You guys can stay seated for the last two songs.
Well, good morning. We, uh, you know, we live in a fallen world, and so we have to put up with one another's grossness also. It's sick season. I hear lots of coughs this morning, and people aren't here, but, you know, it is the result of living in a fallen world, right? Which is what we're going to continue to trudge our way through here. If you would, go ahead and take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Romans 2. And um, it is uh, sludging through the mire, if you want to say. It's um, talking about the depravity of man uh, and the wrath of God upon his image bearers. And so this is, uh, I think Jared said three weeks ago now, it's, you know, this is why we preach expositionally because you don't choose necessarily big sections like this that are uh, just not necessarily fun to talk about, but this is the mankind. This is what we deal with out there. This is what we deal with in here. And so if you guys would go ahead and take your copy of God's Word, turn there and stand with me as we go ahead and read his word this morning. Let's go ahead and start in verse 2, and then I'll go ahead and read all the way through verse 16. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment in another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, who you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will somehow escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will, verse 6, render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also to the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. If you would, go ahead and pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you. We do praise you for revealing our sin to us. Lord, we praise you for when we were running from you, and the way that we were living our lives, Lord, you entered in and you replaced our heart of stone and gave us a new heart. You did that, Lord, and we praise you for that. Lord, you gave us new affections and new desires and new loves in our life. Lord, things that we never saw before, And what's amazing is you continue to reveal to us by your grace, not just how far we were from you, but how you love us so much in spite of us. 
And so, Lord, I pray for this morning as we continue to see the depravity of mankind that we would see the glory of the Son. Lord, that it is you, Jesus, why we celebrate not just this time of the year, but all times of every year, of every month, of every day, of every second, we, we want to celebrate our King, you, Jesus. And so I pray for your dear people today. I pray for your sheep. May you challenge them. May you encourage them. And when I say them, us, me, all of us, we love you, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, some of us have heard or used this phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know. I think we would all agree that at times this phrase or this expression uh, rings true in many arenas of life, from sports to the work world to politics to even in the classroom, many times, and sometimes we can even say most times, it's not what you know, but who you know. And if all of us would think about it for a second, there's little doubt that at one time or another, we knew or maybe we were known by someone to kind of help us out, to have favor on us, or if we want to use the term, play favoritism with us, or we did it with someone else to give us an opportunity to make a team, Uh, to get a job offer that maybe you weren't the most qualified for, but you knew someone who then knew someone that opened the door for you and someone else out there, not so much. Or maybe even possibly getting a pass or getting away with something because of who you know, not necessarily because of what you did, because if it was truly based on what you did, you wouldn't get a pass. Well, obviously what I'm talking about is the idea of favoritism or partiality. And all of us in this room in some regard have been partial or have benefited from someone being partial to us. Playing favorites based on family ties or connections or I know this person who knows this person, right? We all know the guy. We all have the guy. You should try my guy. And then we reference our guy and then we connect the two of them and And then we help one another out. We may think, though, at some time, some of us like to think that we pulled our own bootstraps up and we made our way. That's the American type of mentality. We did it. But in all reality, if we really think about it, we have not become what we've become by ourselves, right? We have become what we've become, if you want to use that expression, in many ways, if we're honest with ourselves, by lots of people stepping into our lives and the Lord opening door piece by piece. And here we are this morning sitting together, helping one another out, again, due to many times not what you know, but who you know and who has known you. Well, that's much different in the courtroom of God. In regards to our standing with God, if left to ourselves, verse 11 says, God shows no partiality on the judgment of mankind. We ended three weeks ago with Pastor Jared, who read this verse and explained this verse, but we're actually going to start there this week, where God shows no partiality. But before we get there, I think it's important, we've been out of this thing for three weeks, to quickly just kind of run through and review. We began this section, if you want to say, all the way back in chapter 1, verses 18, and the bookend is chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through approximately chapter 3, Verse 20. And what Paul did was he began to press our hearts, and particularly he was obviously pressing the church in Rome, but including all of mankind, saying, We are all under the wrath of God due to mankind's unrighteousness. Right? Our separation and our sinfulness is on display in our suppression of God's truth. If you re- recall that whole idea of hiding God's truth, suppressing God's truth, you know it's there, but you press it away. And as they lived, if you remember 1, 18 through 32, that rough section there, that they were living or they live in ways that are unnatural to the way that God intended mankind to live. 
They were suppressing, suppressing the truth. And so God had an intended form and function, function to what he designed, and mankind lived in opposition to it. And so in that section, Paul is predominantly, I would argue, we would argue predominantly talking to Gentiles in verses 18 to 32, those who are in Rome. And so because as you walk through that text, if you look through those sins, the sins that they would have been committing or he would have been describing there are sins that typically at that time were done by Gentiles, were characteristic of a Gentile people. Sins such as shameful, immoral, open sexual relations, including unnatural homosexuality. Not that there, weren't immoral, it, there wasn't immorality going on behind closed doors, but right, the Jews were the moral ones. The Gentiles, they were out there. Evil, maliciousness. They were haters of God. No Jew would have openly just said, I hate God. Right? This was characteristic of Gentiles, inventors of evils, disobedient to parents. Right? It's not that, um, uh, again, Jews' kids weren't disobedient, but it, they were moralized. They were quietly disobedient. You guys know what I'm talking about. Faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And it says at the end of that section, they not only did these things, what did they do? They affirmed those or they gave approval to, they kind of championed those who did them also. And all of these sinful life, lifestyles was in spite of verse 19, if you look back at chapter one, God making it what? Plain to them. Well, how did God make it plain to them? He did it right through creation. And then we got into real quickly uh, chapter 215, which is where we're at today, where he put it, he wrote it on their hearts, on their consciences. Now, remember, the church in Rome consisted of Jews and Gentiles. And if you recall, at one point, right, the Jews were dispersed. They were pushed out by the king at that time, and they were divided. And then there was a point that they came back into the church. They were allowed back into Rome there, and so also in the church. And we all know, historically, Jews and Gentiles don't get along. Now you have to, they enter into the church together, so that it's un. Without a doubt, there would be tension there. They got to figure this thing out. How do we live together as Jews and Gentiles now under a new king? Well, with that relationship in mind, in verses 18 to 32, Paul laid that wrath of God out along with obviously the sinful lifestyle and the suppression of the truth. Now picture yourself, we've used this expression before, oh, how I'd love to be a fly on the wall during that conversation. Oh, I love to have a camera, I guess now we could say that nowadays, in that room while that took place. Well, just picture yourself trying to somehow be there while a group of Jewish people read this letter up to chapter 2, verse 1, if you want to say. And as they read it, maybe their heads kind of swell a little bit as they're thinking about, well, yeah, that's what the Gentiles deserve. Look how they openly rebel and suppress the truth. Now, Paul, an apostle sent on behalf of God, he himself raised a Jew, right, is now putting the Jews' feet to the fire. Yes, we've looked at, if you want to say, the Gentiles. Yes, they did suppress the truth. And you could, again, see the Jews kind of looking around like, yes, we're the favored older brother. We're the favored one. We're the chosen one of God. We're the Jews, we're the ones with the advantages. He gave us the law. The Gentiles, they're a mess. Look how they live. Paul, though, transitions here into chapter 2, and he kind of says, not so fast. Slow down, Jewish people. And he, I, I would argue he puts them on their heels now because he gets into, whoa, you think you're so special, but you're not. He says in verse 1, look at that again, you have no excuse Every one of you who judges, you pass judgment on another. You're condemning yourself at the same time for you do the very same things. You have the law and yet you judge. You practice these things. And then he finishes up this section. If you look at verse eight, just again quickly. But for those who are self-seeking, any of you Jews and do not obey the truth, but you obey unrighteousness also, you just do it kind of secretly, there will be wrath and fury there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, 
the Jew first, actually, and also to the Greek. Well, again, Pastor Jared ends that, ended last week with, for God shows no partiality. And look at that with me. Verse 11, God shows no partiality, no favoritism in this. There's no favoritism or partiality in the salvation of the gospel of God, as we saw in Romans 1, 17. He said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then in verse 8, 9 there, he says, tribulation and distress and difficulty to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so when it comes to tribulation and distress in this context, who will be judged? It says, for all who have sinned without the law or perish will also perish without the law. And so all who have sinned without the law, who's he talking about? Well, clearly he's talking about the Gentiles here who were not given the Mosaic law. They were not... God's people, they were not the Israelites. The Israelites were given the Mosaic law through Moses. And if you recall back in Ephesians, Paul wrote this letter to the church of Ephesus. And in this context, he says the Gentiles were of the, what? Uncircumcision. The Gentiles were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers to the covenant and promises. The Israelites were the one, the Jews were the ones who were given the covenants. They had no hope without God in a According to, again, Romans 1.30, they were haters of God. Well, Paul says the Gentiles without the law will perish without the law. So in other words, in spite of them not having the law, in spite of them not being given the law, the Gentiles still had consequences to their sin. It says that they will perish. They'll face tribulation and distress, and they will perish And so all Gentiles who miss the mark, who fall short of God's holy perfection and God's holy standards will perish. Not because they don't have the law, but because they sin. Because they sin. So mankind sins because they are sinners. Mankind doesn't sin because they don't have the law. Because the law came, what, 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant. Sin had been going on for a long time. So we don't sin because we don't have the law. We sin because we're sinners and we're separate from a holy God. The Gentiles were not given that Mosaic law for a long time. And so they too sinned, if you want to argue, without the law until they got the law given to them through Moses. Well, it says here, the Gentiles who did not have the law will be destroyed. They will perish And some may be sitting here and saying, or some who wherever, well, that's not fair. They didn't have the law. They didn't know the expectations of a holy God. Well, we've already discussed that somewhat, and we'll get into it again in verse 15. But we read this, but earlier, Romans 1, 19, it says, for what can be known about God is what? Plain to them, speaking in particular to the Gentiles, because God has shown it to them. There's no excuse for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world before the law was given and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Though they knew God, he made it plain to them, they did not honor God or give thanks to him. Again, we'll come back to that in a minute in verse 15. Well, back to verse 12, the consequences of perishing in judgment in this context, has an eschatological bent to it, an end times, if you want to say, bent to it, due to our sin, which separates us from a holy and perfect God, mankind then will suffer, not just here, but eternally, the consequences of mankind's sin under God's wrath. So perishing here. 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. Well, who will ultimately spend eternity perishing and being destroyed? Well, 2 Thessalonians says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth. They suppress the truth and to be saved. Therefore, God sends them. He turns them over. Same idea here. A strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness, Romans 1, 18 to 32. 
Well, just a quick understanding of God's judgment. Again, it's not enjoyable to talk about in life. I don't love to think about it all that much, but it's Bible. It's what God revealed in his truth. In Matthew 25, 41, it says, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed. Where? Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, perishing for who are on the left, the goats, those who suppress the truth. And then Matthew 25, he goes on, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will have go into eternal life. What about this? The text where Jesus tells us it's better to get rid of body parts if they're causing you to sin than to go to hell. Why? And if your eye calls you to sin, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown into hell. Verse 48, this is graphic here. Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. This next one is most chilling to me. The, the story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man had a poor man who laid at the gate, right, named Lazarus, and Lazarus was covered in sores, and he begged for food. And he would wait around, just a, a scrap of food would just fall to the ground and that he could eat it. What happens? The poor man dies, and he's carried to Abraham's side into glory, and the rich man dies, and he's buried, and where is he carried to? Into hell and torment. Remember the scraps that Lazarus, just give me a scrap of food. And this is what it says. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man died. In Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and to just cool my tongue. For I am in anguish in this flame. Lazarus just wanted a scrap of food on earth. Now he just wants a drop of water, an eternal punishment. Mankind perishes even without the law due to their sin, which separates them from a holy God. God shows no partiality. All have sinned. All Gentiles have sinned without the law and will be destroyed without the law. Again, the Jew reading this, well, that makes sense. Look how they live. You just laid this out to us. They live in unnatural ways. They hate God. They deserve what they're getting, the due penalty of their error that you said in chapter 1, verse 27. And Paul again says, not so fast, Jews. Remember, I said God shows no partiality. Romans 2, 12b, it says, and all who have sinned under the law, those who have the law, Jews, will be judged by the law. You're Jewish. You were given the law. You're under the law. And what Paul's saying here in many ways obviously includes himself, for he is also Jewish. He says, we are culpable. If anything, we're more culpable. We have, we have the written law. God gave it to us through our father Moses. We clearly know the expectations written down on the scrolls. If there's any younger versus older siblings in here, right? I've heard myself say it before, you're, you're such and such an age, you know for sure what you should be doing. They're four. They can throw and put holes in the wall. No, I'm just kidding. But you know what I mean? Like, you're the older one. You have the law. You have it written down. You're more culpable, if you want to say. You have the law, Jews. You teach the law. Again, he puts himself in this boat. We teach the, teach the law. We listen to the law. We memorize the law. We know the law. By the way, we'll be judged by the very law that we know. In spite of what you think, just because of your heritage, we know it, we listen to it, we memorize it, and we don't get a pass on it and just get to give it to everyone else. He says, no, you'll be judged by it. In spite of what some of you may think, and this was a thing at that time, that the law, we need to teach the law, we need to tell others about the law, 
because we have the law, but in a sense, the law doesn't apply to me like we get a pass. Because they would say things, but wait a second, Paul, we are God's chosen people. We, we, are, we honor and adhere to the Sabbath. We fast. Like we tithe. Do you know what the Gentiles do? We pray, and we in general live, at least from what people see, a pretty morally upright life. We're not like those guys. I mean, those guys are immoral and sexually immoral, and they hate God. They don't, they don't go to the synagogue. They don't pray. They don't tithe. They could care less about any of that stuff. In the end, God has to let us in. Sound like someone we know? The Pharisee in Luke 18? God, I thank you that I'm not like other guys. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers. I'm th thankful I don't cheat on my wife and I'm a justice type of guy, at least from what other people see. I pay my taxes on time, at least from what other, other people see. I fast twice a week. I give tithes, I give, I give to the church a little bit. I'm glad I'm not like all those guys that don't do that. Thomas Schreiner said, from the Jewish point of view, of course, this difference in possession of God's law is absolutely basic. The Gentiles, so most Jews maintain, could experience God's favor only by taking on the yoke of the law. Outside Israel, the sphere of the law, there is no salvation. The Jews who live within the domain on the law, on the other hand, often consider themselves virtually assured of salvation. What's wild is I still hear this today. I heard this not too long ago. Like the Jews just get a pass or something because they're Jewish. No, Jews, you will be judged and ultimately condemned because the standard by which you will be judged is the very one that you know so well and you must live unto perfectly in order to be right with God. You can't just hear it. You can't just teach it. You can't just listen to it. You have to, from beginning to end, live the whole thing perfectly. Essentially, what Paul has continued to do is press and place all mankind, Jews and Gentiles, under the same umbrella as sinners in the hands of a holy God. You know, what Paul's doing really is communicating the opposite of Galatians 3. Galatians 3 says this, right? There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're in Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring. Here's what Paul's saying here. Jews, please listen. In spite of what you may have been taught or caught by your upbringing, there is neither Jews who have the law nor Greeks who do not have the law. There is neither slaves who are under the bondage of their master nor free men and the privileged ones who think they're free. There is neither male nor female. All, all who have sinned are perishing and under the condemnation and wrath of God. And Paul drives us all the way to the end, and we'll get there at some point where he says, what then? He reminds us, are we better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. We don't get a pass. God doesn't show partiality. For there is no distinction for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. This is the argument he's making from 118 all the way through 320. He's reminding them all Gentiles and Jews are under the same umbrella. We are separate from this holy God. This had to have no doubt made some Jews angry, put them on their heels, made them rethink. They're, they're hearing that the mere possession of the law that they, were, they thought they were so privileged to have and receive through their father Moses and the covenants that they got. We were the chosen people. We got the covenants. There's, you mean there's no guarantees here? There, there's no background guarantees? What we teach and read and memorize and sin under, that doesn't make me right with God. I've been doing this my whole life. I mean, I know the whole thing. I know the law better than anyone. He says, no, the only thing that can make you right with God, justify you, declare you right in the courtroom is to perfectly, fully, purely, without any waiver, 24 hours a day, live unto the law. Live unto the law. Hearing versus doing. Look at verse 13. 
It's not the hearers of the law. Now, remember the context we're in as we read these verses. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Oh, so Paul's just creating a works-based salvation here. Now, let's get into this for a second. There, what he's saying, there's no advantage, there's no favoritism of Jew or Gentile when it comes to their standing and their rightness before God. All Jews, Gentiles, will have their day in the courtroom. Every single person in here today and every human being, every image bearer in the history of the world will have their day in the courtroom of God. And each of us will stand there. And our ethnic heritage, our nationality, our family makeup, the town we grew up in, our social status in society, our economic status, none of that, our last names, None of that will give any of us an advantage when it comes to standing in the courtroom of God. On earth, there's partiality. There's favoritism. You know so-and-so, your last name so-and-so. All right, we can work this out. Not in the courtroom of God. How often have you heard someone or heard something and you understand it and you get to understand it so well that you could even teach it? So you understand something and you hear something. Yet, we don't really believe what we understand and maybe we've even taught before because we don't live unto what we taught and we say we believe. Right? In spite of knowing something and you could even teach something, you don't live unto something. A couple of examples real quick. I remember when I was a kid, I went to this doctor, no names please, right? And I remember every time I went to this doctor, it was our family doctor, and I know my brother can sit there and laugh with me. I, we walked out of his office, and we saw him on the side of the building smoking his cigarettes. Every time. Right? Guaranteed Bill's going to get questions. Who was it, man? Or what about the certified nutritionist, right? The, the person who knows and can recite all the ways one should eat, right? how they should exercise, and we'll just leave it there, Right? Or the financial guru who can tell you, you know, what the stock market's doing and what they should do and what you should do with your finances, but they're broke and they're in debt up to their eyeballs. But they can tell you how to manage your money. God's law only justifies, justifies, only declares one right with God if they not merely hear it and teach it, but do it perfectly. Doers here can be translated performers or producers. Yeah, in the sports arena, I guess if you want to say, oh, those who talk a lot of smack, but they don't back it up, right? They, they can talk all day long, but they don't perform. They don't produce. When we on our own, and that phrase is key, we're going to come back to that. When we on our own go into the courtroom of God, merely hearing and knowing God's law will not justify us. There must be full, airtight, fully satisfied performance. When you stand before God, you have to be able to say, I did the law perfectly to be able to be right with God. Do all the law requires. If you, if, if, if you can do it all, you will be hypothetically declared righteous based on what you have done. Paul, Paul there's a sense here where Paul's talking in theory. He's saying, in other words, in theory, I, I actually agree with you. If someone stood before God and did all that the law requires, yeah, they'll be justified. They'll be right with God. Douglas Moo brings this up here where he says, Paul uses the principle to remind Jews of the standard of God's judgment. Only those who are doers of the law will be declared right with God. Again, he's not talking about the outcome of our salvation. We're in the context of the depravity of mankind, what he's saying hypothetically is, yeah, if you can do the whole thing from beginning to end, yeah, you can be justified. You can be right with God. He goes on and says, this first verse confirms and explains the reason for the Jews' condemnation in verse 12b. And this suggests that its purpose is not to show how people can be justified, but to set forth the standard that must be met if a person is to be justified. The Jewish people believe that doing the law, or perhaps the intent to do the law, would lead for a people already in covenant relationship with God to final salvation. What Paul is doing here is pressing the Jews, and it reminded me of a couple of encounters actually Jesus had. If you remember some of these encounters, right? The, 
Luke 10, Jesus tells the parable, and there's, a, there's this lawyer, right? Pretty smart guy. He's a lawyer. Stood up and before Jesus and said, teacher, what do I got to do? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds, and he says to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And Jesus answers the question, this, what this guy should do, all that is written in the law. And Jesus wants to make sure this guy, they're on the same page, right? How do you read it? How do you hear it? Well, the guy responds. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. I mean, does this guy understand what he's saying here? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself perfectly. Jesus responds, all right, we're on the same page. He understands it. He hears it. He can probably teach it. Jesus then says, you're right. Now do this and you will live. You're right. Go ahead. You have it right. You hear it. You can teach it. Do each and every part of it perfectly, sinlessly, in perfect holiness, and you'll have eternal life. Same thing in Matthew 19. He says, rich guy comes to Jesus, says, behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Verse 17, Jesus responds, keep the commandments, keep the law. The young ruler says, which parts? Verses 19, Jesus responds and lays out the entire thing. In other words, Jesus says, you got to keep all of it. All of it? And the guy responds, well, he lies actually and says, well, I've done all of it. I did it all. And then in Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus responds, all right, even though you just lied because you haven't done it all, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. The rich guy hears this and what happened? He went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Jesus responds, okay, even though you've lied, you think you've kept the law, sell it all. The rich guy essentially says, I don't think so because he can't. Paul is saying, Jews, there's a major difference between knowing the law, hearing the law, teaching the law, memorizing the law, and living unto the law perfectly. Verse 13b, the doers of the law who will be justified. Again, Paul agrees in theory, doing the law perfectly can lead to salvation. It's not just the intent of living unto the law. It's not just trying to live unto the law but you have to do it perfectly. And yes, okay, you can be right with God. You can't think about your heritage, none of that stuff. Obeying the Mosaic law, every nook and cranny of it. There's a problem though, right? We can't do it. Isaiah 64, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities, our sins like the wind, take us the way. There's no one who calls upon your name who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our sins. Why is he hidden his face from us? Because we're not right with him. He's a holy God, we're a sinful people. All of us, separate. And anyone sitting in the church room who has been... Anyone sitting in, I'm sorry, this room who has been church from the room, womb can relate to this because it can be easy to fall into this trap, guys, where we go through the motions of doing church and you get in the courtroom and you say, but God, I went to church. Like I went to church every Sunday. I was with the saints. I was around the saints all the time. I know the truth. I heard it. I could probably teach some of it. I gave a portion back to you, I thought. I served. Oh, how I served. Everyone saw how I served. I memorized. I recited tons of Bible verses. By the way, do you know my parents? Like, they love Jesus. I mean, come on. Do you not see how the world's living out there? You got to get, I got to be in. I mean, the Gentiles, if you want to use that expression, in our day today, do you understand? Just click the news. Lord, you watch the news. Come on. Let, you got to let me in. Says the Jews here, I don't care how moral you are or how moral you think you are or what background you have or what status you have, whether you're a guy or a girl, 
all human beings, back to verse nine, tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, evil being anything short of the law. To those who have been given the law, the Jews, and yes, even to those who are, were not given the law, the Gentiles, but actually they still have the law. Look at verse 14 and 15 with me. So he tells the Jews, you, you have the law, you are under the law. Uh, the Gentiles who didn't have the law, but there's a sense where they too have the law. Look at verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, so they don't have the law, but by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Huh? They show the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or excuse them. Well, it appears to me these are kind of difficult verses and to fit in context, but it appears to me Paul brings this up for two reasons. One, he wants to continue to press the Jews that all human beings are under God's wrath and judgment. But two, he wants to remind the Jews that although they were given the law, the law doesn't help them or propel them any further down the road to be justified. For Gentiles also had the law. They just didn't have the Mosaic law. The law was written on their hearts is what it says. Gentiles also possessed the law, Jewish, dear Jewish people. They were not given scrolls, if you want to say, but it's on their hearts and it's testifying to their consciences as they know, although they, they might not live this way, but they know right and wrong as either they are excused or accused of their behavior in light of the law that's written on their hearts. And so in the flow of the argument here, I would argue Paul is for sure not talking about Gentile Christians who would have the law of Christ, right? And can be a sweet aroma to Christ, who would be given a new heart of flesh. This is not speaking in reference to supernatural, spiritual reality of a new heart in a spirit and dwelt believer, Gentile believer. I agree with Douglas Moo who says this, when Paul speaks of the work of the law written in the heart, therefore he is merely pointing out that the Gentiles know the commands contained in the Mosaic law. This should not be confused with Jeremiah's promise that the law will be written on the heart in a saving work of God. The purpose is to show that they know what the law commands. In other words, it's right alongside or in addition to what Paul said in Romans 1 again, where it's plain to them. The natural man, although separated from Christ, it is plain to them, right? God, it's plain to them. They don't have the Mosaic law, but they possess that which is written on their hearts and the moral law written on their hearts, God has placed in all image bearers and these things are working together and they're bearing witness, either accusing them of what they're doing and telling them they're wrong or they're excusing them of what they're doing and saying, no, what you're doing is not wrong. And I love this term bearing witness here. It's directly translated that these things are testifying in their hearts. So in mankind's hearts, written on our hearts, we have a courtroom going on all the time. Non-believers, they work together, testify together that there are times where they accuse the individual of wrongdoing, while the other times they accuse them of, or excuse them, and they're doing right. Well, how do we know this? Like, it's one thing to say all that and that there's this thing going on well, there's no doubt that we live in an evil world. I know I could go around to everyone in here, you'd like laugh if I tried to convince you we don't live in an evil world. None of us have to look very far to know that. And actually, we can all, let's not look out there, we can probably all many times look inside our own four walls of our homes and be reminded that we live in a sinful fallen world because sin happens. But we can also, with that said, in many ways, is it not astonishing that people are not as evil as they could be? Like we focus so much on the sin and the evilness of our world and what's going on all over the world. And it is evil, but it's not as evil as it could be. Those who do not know the Lord still in general in our society, in general, typically stop at stop signs. 
right? Not everyone runs stop signs. They typically wait in line and say please and thank you. People, especially at this time of the year, give to charities. They help a neighbor at times. They shovel a driveway for someone. I mean, how many of us know a neighbor or a coworker or a friend who you know for sure does not know the Lord, and yet you'd be like, man, that's one of the nicest guys I know. I mean, I live between two of them. My house is situated between two non-believers that would let me borrow any tool or help me move anything in my house or do whatever. They're just kind people, and yet they don't know the Lord. Or how about many of our children, before they even know the law at all, right, they drop their head when they know they've done something wrong. I can promise you all the four-year-olds that go to this church don't know the Ten Commandments. But yet they know because there's a, there's a courtroom going on here. Well, how do we, they know it's wrong. They're being accused in their conscience and the law written on their heart. It's bearing witness. It's testifying to them. Those who don't know the Bible at all or the Mosaic law can somewhat still live moral lives, right? My, my family didn't know that we didn't know the Lord going, growing up and most of my childhood, or actually all of my childhood, I did not know the Lord. I didn't know the things of God at all. I knew nothing of the Bible. Um, I called job, job. That's right, turn to job. It's Job, okay? I didn't know what the book of Exodus was. But yet we, we live somewhat moral lives, right? John Stott says this is an observable, verifiable fact which anthropologists have everywhere discovered. Not all human beings are crooks, blackguards, thieves, adulterers, and murderers. On the contrary, some honor their parents, recognize the sanctity of human life, are loyal to their spouses, practice honesty, speak the truth, and cultivate contentment, just as the last of the six of the Ten Commandments do. And so the conscience alongside God's law written on the hearts bears witness accusing or defending them. It's a universal reality of mankind. By the way, this is on our side when we witness. When we share the truth of the gospel, this, these things are actually on our side. But Jews, you have the law and you don't keep it perfectly and still live in sin because you're sinners. So think about the opposites here. Jews, you have the law. You don't keep it perfectly. You still live in sin because you're sinners. Gentiles can at times live more lives, and yet they don't have the written Mosaic law. All of mankind, Jews and Gentiles, are sinners in the hands of a wrathful and condemning God. Why? Well, they both fail to do the law as God intended it to be obeyed because they're a sinful people. Both parties you're not anywhere ahead of the game because of the family you're raising or your heritage are in a fallen state and will perish and be eternally condemned forever and ever because of your suppression of the truth. And that's what Paul will go on to say in Romans 7. Did that which is good according to the law then bring me death to be? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. We'll get there when we develop and develop that verse more, but Paul wraps up this week saying to these predominantly Jewish people, you have no advantage. By the way, dear Jews, dear moral people, everything you think you have kept hidden, it's not so hidden after all. Look at verse 16. On that day, while you stand in the courtroom of God, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. In other words, we can't hide on our own. We, we can't hide on our own in the courtroom of God. And I, I use that phrase again very purposely, and we'll come back to it. We cannot hide on our own. In the meantime, one day, on that day, in alignment with the gospel, God will judge every single and obvious sin and the ones no one knows about. We can all be honest, there's a lot of them. The sins of commission will be judged. 
right? The sins of commission, the sins that we know for sure that we committed, the sins that we were out there, we knowingly and actively committed, things that you actively engaged in and know is wrong and sinful, those are the sins of commission, the sins of omission. You know, there's sins that we commit, we don't even know we're committing. It ha- when we're living in the depravity of our life and our hearts are not changed, sin takes place and you don't even think about it. So on a fixed day in one's natural state, one only wishes they could hide. But man won't be able to because Christ Jesus, the appointed one, will judge according to his gospel sinful sinners and their attempted secrecy of sin. And I just sit there for a second. There's no doubt there are some in this room who there's ugly things going on behind the scenes. If you're a sinner, I beg you to expose that stuff to a dear brother or sister and confess your sins and repent. There's no doubt there's non-believers in here that are committing secret sins. Because by the way, in today's day and age, it's really easy to commit secret sins. And dear young people, I would beg you to expose those things with your parents. It's actually a hedge of protection when you only think of the consequences, right? I beg you to expose those things. Well, the appointed one Paul talked about, or Luke talked about in Acts 10, and he commanded us to preach the, to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. And he went on there, and he, and he God, commands all people everywhere to repent. Why? Because there's a fixed day. There's a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Paul told the church of Corinth, the mess of Corinth, therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. There's gonna be a final verdict on each individual and all mankind. Those who have the law and those who have never read the Bible are all accountable to a holy God to God's standards, and you come up short even for one second of your life in condemnation and perishing if you hide on your own will take place. Paul agreed, as I said earlier, that we can say that in theory justification can be secured through works. The problem is, as Paul is clearly presenting, is our bondage to sin and our entrapment to sin disables for us from ever being justified or declared right with God on our own. In practice, achieving the fulfillment of the law for humans is impossible, although in theory is possible. Justification declared right or righteous is achieved through work, but it's not our work. It is fulfilled through a human but not merely a human, but one who is sinless and fully human and fully God. No mere human has ever done it. In the history of mankind from Adam and Eve till today, the last baby that was just born, the last second has ever been able to be right with God on their own, except the one that is at the center of why Paul so desperately wants to come to Rome and tell them about Christ, fully God, fully man, who is the appointed one and the right one with God, for he is God himself. He is the one and only one who we have to be hidden in. We cannot go to the courtroom on our own, strutting in by ourselves. We have to go into the courtroom hidden in Jesus. Because if we go by ourselves, we fail and we're condemned. Because that one, Jesus, is the only one who said what? Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I came and fulfilled them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it's 
all accomplished. By the way, you can't accomplish it. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom. Jesus is the great one. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, it won't. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the one who came to fulfill the law, and he could and he did. It was accomplished. The only one who perfectly and fully teaches them and does them, did them, was Jesus. Our righteousness will never exceed the scribes and the Pharisees on our own. But his righteousness, which is credited to our account, that's alien righteousness that we talk about. It's credited to our account by his grace alone, through faith alone, enables us to then walk into the courtroom hidden in Christ and we're right with God. We're justified. We're right with God, yes, on work, his works. His work at the cross. And that's why I had John read Colossians 3, which says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's how we enter the courtroom. We have to be able to say, I hide in the one that I have faith in, that which is Jesus. I'm hidden in him. I'm not going in on my own. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Because of my work? No, because of his work. And on that day, if you stand before God alone and you have a speck of thinking that you did anything, you will perish and you will reap the due penalty of your sin. But on that day, if you're hidden with Christ and have faith fully in his righteousness, your sins and the secrecy of them have already been paid for. So you walk in freely, coming before the Lord. All the sins already paid for, I'm with him. I'm hidden in Jesus. And so with that, I pray in the midst of a chapter that is not fun, that you're encouraged if you're a believer because all the secret thoughts, all the intentions of the heart, all the ugliness of our life, was paid for at the cross. And we can stand and worship because of that. I can't leave, though, without saying, if you don't know him, it's not paid for unless you, by faith alone, trust in him alone, and he will save you from your sins. Let's go ahead and stand and let's pray. Oh, Lord, it's uh, a humbling understanding. And I pray that I and we do not think anything of ourselves. Lord, our pride rears in and it creeps into our hearts. Our thoughts are ugly. You paid for that at the cross. Lord, I pray you forgive us for any wayward way that's in us. Your children, may we come back to the foot of the cross and be reminded. Maybe there's, there's someone in here who's, they're in sin or they've sinned recently and, and think almost they have to, to climb the holiness ladder again. That's not true. You, you declared us right with you, Lord. You made us right with you by the, blood of your son. We're at the top rung of the ladder. We are justified, declared right. We walk in hidden in your son. May we have joy today as we sing this song. May we have joy knowing that truth. Lord, I, oh, I, Lord, I pray for guys and girls in here who don't know you. Lord, please, I know there's people in here knowing someone. Your saints are sitting here right now or standing here thinking of someone that, oh, they want to know you so bad. 
Lord, please save your people. And may you give them joy as we sing. In Christ's name, amen. just a, a small reminder of the wonder of his love. Uh, why would he love us? Because uh, the secret thoughts and intentions we know outside of Christ were really not good. And so praise the Lord that he loves us and he is for us. And so let me read, go ahead and read. Remember, uh, Pastor John is in the meet and greet. For anyone who's here who maybe has never been here, has been here a couple times, or just if you want to just go uh, talk to John. He likes to talk, so just, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, he, he would love to talk with you guys, seriously, about this King Jesus. You know, we get to the end of this section, and, and here's where it's, yes, ah, I can breathe. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, all the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So that's our hope. As we leave here today, that's our hope. So let me pray, and then we'll exit here. Lord, thank you again. All who believe, thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for our sins. You paid it all. All of it, you paid it. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>